uh, we essentially hold and refine a thesis in terms of where we are at in terms of the global macro cycle, right? Particularly as it pertains to price dynamics and output dynamics. Uh, to many of you who are in the investment world, when one talks about global macro investing, one really uh, talks about and thinks about a two-dimensional space, a uh, two-dimensional world in which you have price dynamics along with activity uh, momentum. And so that gives you a, a sort of a quadrant type of, uh, of output space in which you can either have a, you know, four possible scenarios in which uh, you have either a combination of inflation, disinflation along with either expansion in terms of activity or uh, uh, contraction. And each of these uh, combinations uh, along the price activity uh, um, uh, domain carries different type of implications in terms of how you want to position your portfolio. Do you, in particular, do you want to be overweight equities, own more equities, or own more bonds, or hold more cash, uh, be more exposed to the dollar, be less exposed to the dollar, uh, the same to volatility and other factors. So uh, I just wanted to share with you in this uh, minute and a half in terms of what we mean by global macro investing, as otherwise it will be hard for you to conceptualize or you know, essentially allo you know, uh, allocate, uh, uh, place my comments in, in, the, in the appropriate uh, cell. So with that, uh, prelim those preliminaries, uh, our views in terms of the macro landscape, where are we at the way we see it? We, Paulo spoke very, very uh, uh, generously about our, our, our past and our background. We do make a lot of mistakes. We get a lot of calls wrong. Uh, so humility is a very important attribution attribute in any endeavor, uh, uh, human endeavor, and it is particularly of the essence when it comes to investing, as the 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 biggest uh, uh, humbler uh, that there exists out there is really the markets. The markets test you and prove to you each day whether you're right or wrong. And so, uh, as I mentioned to uh, folks that I, uh, that I talk to and some seminars that I, uh, that, that I deliver to traders and investors, uh, at the end of the day, you, you become humble either by, by an aspiration or just purely on account of profession. So with that, what is our view in terms of where we're at at the macro uh, level? So our view is that we are at a, a potentially important and defining stage of the global macro and market landscape. What do I mean by that? I mean by that a couple of things. Uh, global liquidity, which had been expanding on a sustained basis since 2009, is now contracting, is, is now going in reverse. Good example is the month of October. Month of October, to some of you who are invested in the markets, witnessed the largest uh, downturn in risk assets in, since 2010. Uh, so it is interesting that that pullback in risk assets that we witnessed in the month of October coincided with the tightening of liquidity, both on the part of the Fed as well as on the part of the ECB. In the case of the ECB, the quantum of asset purchases is actually compressed by 15 billion. It marked the top of the cycle. From a behavioral perspective, it's more of a technical trading aspect. It's one of the reasons why we were cautious early in the month of October. But if you also look at the Fed and what the Fed did during the month of October, it further uh, continued on its quantitative tightening mode. So the Fed is on a quantitative tightening phase. It is tightening liquidity overtly. The European Central Bank, it is unwinding it is decelerating the quantum of its asset purchase program, which means that on the, on, the derivative, on the first derivative sense, it is tightening liquidity. So it is not an opinion. It is a fact that liquidity is tightening. Evidently, there are those of you in the audience who might feel that there are multiple definitions of liquidity, you know, rates, spreads, et cetera, and we can talk about all of that in the Q&A session. But the reality is that liquidity is tightening, number one. Second element that is important to any sort of global macro thesis is that the activity momentum is actually decelerating. It, again, it's not an opinion. Some of my prior um, uh, speakers uh, today, this morning, Alex Werner and others, uh, did allude to you know the latest estimates on the part of the IMF staffers, uh, showing that they're, they're the latest estimates on WIO or whatever it's called these days, essentially mark a downgrade from the estimates, the projections that were generated six months ago or three months ago. So the the momentum in terms of revisions is to the downside. JP Morgan also has a very nice forecast 
uh, JP Morgan revision indicator across countries and groups. Many of you who are in the industry are aware of it. They, they generated, essentially it's a compilation of um, the momentum of Wall Street economist forecast on activity and growth on a 12 month forward basis. And you can look at it for any country around the world, any of the major ones, China, you know, the US, et cetera. And that indicator is trending lower. So momentum on activity is going down. Liquidity is getting tighter. That's not necessarily a favorable backdrop for risk markets, for risk asset markets. But moreover, if you look at other elements of risk asset investing, namely risk premia, where are we at? Well, we have Mr. Trump. Today the markets are up nicely because Mr. Trump sent out a tweet that his, you know, that his discussions with China are going well. Of course, you can, you know, you can be somewhat conspiratorial in, in, uh, in listening to that uh, Twitter remark and say, well, we're a few days away from the uh, midterm elections. The markets have taken a huge beating. So Mr. Trump wants to get a majority in both houses of Congress. So it's, it's important to go into the weekend with a stable market, you know, technically, in terms of technical levels on, S on the S&P and many indices, we're really at a, at a defining levels from a technical trading perspective. So I think that there, you, can, you can come up with interesting stories on that. So, but the reality is that the bigger picture, removing ourselves from the next three days, is that geopolitical risk premium is higher today than it has been in a number of years, point number one. Secondly, elements of the risk asset markets, particularly uh, term premia, when it comes to the fixed income markets, have been tremendously suppressed are at a historical low levels. Now, we can talk about in the Q&A session in terms of what accounts for that uh, massive um, compression in term premia. My view is that it has to do with the political mandate on the part of the ECB, the, the fact that I think the biggest bubble in the world today and over the last 45 years is the German Bunds, you know, is the Govies, the government bond market in Europe. That to me is the biggest bubble in 40, 45 years. And because markets are globalized, particularly the bond market, that compression of term premia is supporting long-term yields in the U.S. In any event, why do I say that? I say that because as central banks in Europe and the U.S. are tightening liquidity, it is quite conceivable that term premia could actually move higher, which is not a good thing when it comes to risk assets. So looking ahead, I already spoke about the background from an activity cycle uh, perspective, and I already spoke about liquidity. There's another element that I'm going to touch about in a moment, which is the dollar. But the third exhibit is we have this latent risk factor, namely uh, very low term premia. And if that normalizes, that could impact other risk assets, including equities and credit. Okay? Now let's talk about the dollar. The dollar has been strengthening significantly. Now, why is that? And that's the fourth leg on which I'll, I'll shortly wrap this up but, and then open up to Q&A and so on and so forth. Is a strong, the dollar has been strengthening this year. Partly is for many reasons, evidently, right? Is the geopolitical risk premium yeah, the associated with the trade war uh, frictions, but it's also a result of policy divergences, right? The fact that the Federal Reserve has been hiking, has been normalizing rates at a time when the Bank of Japan sticking to its quantitative easing program, and at a time when the European Central Bank also has remained quite lax when it, ter when it comes to uh, liquidity and rates. So that policy divergence I would, uh, I would submit as a thesis, again, we can discuss this f in multiple ways, has been driving the dollar higher. Why is this relevant for risk markets? You might say, okay, why are you talking about the dollar since we're talking about the global macro and market outlook? I think the dollar strengthening at a juncture in which liquidity is tightening and a juncture in which the cycle is weakening or it might be weakening, we can disagree, is, is problematic from an investing an economic outlook perspective because the big elephant in the room is debt. Global debt levels have continued to escalate since the Great Recession, even though Tim doesn't like that term, since the Great Recession period of 2007, 2009. So global debt, the balance sheet of the world, is, is a lot higher than it was then. Of course, assets have been generated, but we can talk about what kind of assets have been have been generated during that time. But there's a lot of debt in the world, and that, a lot of that debt has been is US dollar denominated. Brazilian corporates, Russian corporates, Chinese corporates, uh, and so on and so forth. So a stronger dollar at a t that coinc coinciding with a, a weakening momentum in the rest of the world and, and with very, very high uh, levels of indebtedness 
is also problematic for risk assets, right? Credit, cre the credit markets come under stress. I'll give you two exhibits. The default rate in China for China's Chinese corporates, Goldman has a couple of interesting reports in the last Goldman Sachs, in the last two months, more than Merrill and other banks, the, the Goldman has been focusing on it. Default rates have been escalating very significantly. I think they're growing at, they're, they're reaching a, a rate of about five and a half to six percent. And the year now hasn't ended yet, much higher than last year. And, um, and so, and second exhibit is month of October. The month of October marked the worst month for high yield, U.S. high yield debt, in quite a few years. So I think that when we look at certain areas of the markets, away from emerging market equities, which have been decimated since the month of April, the month of October brought with us a lot of weakness. And many of you might think it's just the S&P, the Dow. No. Just look under the hood. Credit markets, other areas of the markets are showing that, you know, there's stress in the system. So with that, those four pillars, you can pretty much uh, uh, infer from a market perspective what, it, what are our views. Our views are that uh, given this policy divergence, given that we have a new Fed, we have Rich Clarida, someone we know from academic years, years ago. Uh, we have Powell, who's not an economist, although he's worked at the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Fed. Rich has made his name in international doing debt papers, as I did in 88, 87. He's aware of what's going on. But he's talking the party line. He gave, delivered his first speech last week at Clarida as vice chair of the Fed, and he's pretty much sticking to the party line at the Fed, which means that they will continue to normalize rates. Uh, the president is challenging the independence of the Federal Reserve, right, as all of you are aware. And so what that may do, and what that is likely to do, is that will really reinforce the commitment of the Fed to maintaining to that, that, ri that, ri that ra the raising of rates. So I think that if I look ahead, the conclusions that I, that I, that I arrive at is uh, the Fed funds rate, you know, policy rates are going to continue go, to go higher in the U.S. Let's find out what happens to the cycle. For now, there's some deceleration. Again, humility is very important. We could be wrong. Latest data shows that CapEx dynamics in the U.S., CapEx numbers, capital expenditures, actually have un well undershot what all Wall Street economists have been expecting, Goldman, Merrill, all of the houses. So capital expenditure, which is the predominant, this is the paramount barometer of confidence on the part of CEOs and corporates in terms of future profitability and future profit margins. There's data. I didn't put together slides because <laughs> I thought that it would, the, 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 the setup would be different. But if you look at a chart for the U.S. economy, the, the, the closest and more, most robust indicator, um, uh, uh, prior indicator uh, of, future, uh, of future profit margin dynamics is really CapEx. And so the fact that on a year when tax cuts have been so so large in the U.S., the U.S. corporates have, have been deploying a lot of that those savings uh, to essentially the buyback of shares and not capex doesn't leave much for optimism. So, what do we do with all of that? What we do with all of that, I think that you, what do you do in this environment? I'm not saying that there's a recession around the corner. I think it's unlikely, just purely on arithmetic grounds. What do I mean by that? If you look at the quantum of the tax cut under Trump along with the government expenditure increase, the impetus to, the impulse to growth, to GDP growth on an annualized basis, going to at least the third quarter of next year is about 90 basis points. It's 0.9%. So for a recession to obtain, well, you need a, you know, given that CapEx has been dead in the water in the U.S., and given that the U.S. economy is a closed economy, it's not really impacted that much by the, what happens in the rest of the world, you would need the consumer to go into recession in the U.S., and that's a very slow-moving super tanker. I, I don't see any signs yet of the U.S. consumer going to a recession. So I think my best guess is that a recession is not yet a 2019 uh, scenario or possibility. It might be a 2020. But markets, as I think it was Tim or Alex or, or Paolo mentioned, is a discounting me mechanism. It looks ahead. And I think that you know we could have a situation where there is no recession next year, but risk markets come under pressure. What, does that mean that everything is going to go down in price? No. I think what, what do you do in those environments? If you look at the, the, the historical data and what kind of styles in terms of asset markets, not just equities but other asset markets, what styles perform favorably in those environments, you essentially have value. Uh, market uh, segments that are cheap tend to do well. That actually was the case in October. So we got a 
a, 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 what is it, a preview, like when you go to the movie theater, we already got a preview. If you look under the hood, you, you see a lot of things. The market doesn't always show its hand, but if you look and work hard enough, you can detect what is happening. Uh, so I think value, where's value today? In global equities, essentially Japan, emerging market equities, although they're very volatile. And then there are secular growth, strong growth stories that are strong from a balance sheet perspective, and those are in the US, software. We like software uh, uh, names, we don't like hardware, IT. And then you might say, well, Bob, how about bank stocks? You know, shareholder yields close to 8%, yeah, but you know, we have Italy. We haven't spoken about Italy. Well, I'll defer that to the Q&A session. Uh, Europe has an issue with Italy and with the whole concept of the euro, so we'll talk about it in the Q&A session. But to wrap it up on global equities, I would say that I would be, would be slightly underweight uh, because I think value had, got, had gotten crushed, okay? And those would be the segments of the global equity markets that I, that I like. Uh, I think it, you should barbell that exposure in terms of your portfolio by, by being overweight cash. The optionality value or the option value of cash should not be underestimated. You know, given that the uncertainty is high, we have midterm elections next week, and we have you know, the direction of the dollar. The dollar is going bananas on account of various things, right? Um, and we have the Italy question. If the Italy question, I think it's November 11th, when, the, when it goes back to the EC, to the European Commission, you know, perhaps good news comes out of it. I don't know. I mean, again, humility. I don't know. I don't have a say in it. So we just have to be cautious. So the optionality value of cash is important. And in terms of fixed income, you know, I think that, what's the view? My fundamental view on fixed income is, and it's been my view since 2009, and we've had chat with, you know, a, a lot of macro guys, including Manuel Santos, Professor Manuel Santos and others, and Lucas and many others, is that, and in a way, Federico spoke about it, I believe that the microstructure of the global economy is eminently disinflationary. It's eminent disinflationary courtesy of IT. It is, you know, the, big, the, the cloud, big data, AI, all of these wonderful things, they're disinflationary, they uh, decentralize activity, they uh, strengthen the contestability, the contestable nature of markets, which essentially, you know, you, uh, the price discovery mechanism. And so I think the long-term outlook, I'm not concerned about inflation. Second point, many w Wall Street economists, including the Goldmans of the world, Hat Jian and others, always talk about, oh, fo huge focus on wage, gr wage inflation. And they tend to underestimate the fact that what matters to inflation is unit labor cost, right? 60 to 70% of the variance of inflation is captured by unit labor cost. And so if it, wages are going up because the economy is more productive, courtesy of IT and other matters, you shouldn't be concerned about the inflation boogeyman coming into the room. So I think that what, that doesn't mean, though, that I'm bullish bonds, especially with the Fed remaining very focused and, and, and really forced by, by Trump to hike rates. So I think in fixed income, I would keep duration short just because I don't want to, I don't want to try to catch a falling knife with the Fed continuing to hike, and I also uh, want to, and, and then I also want to wait for a resolution of the biggest bubble in the world, which is the European uh, government bond market. Right, the moment the you know European bond yields, government bond yields normalize, you know that will impact global markets, and I don't know the scale with which that will happen. Why? Because there is no precedent for what we're seeing. I mean, the longest running government bond market, which is the gilts market, goes back 600 to 700 years. When you look at data, like inflation adjust those uh, long-term yields on government debt paper, there is no precedent. I mean, you have an economy, just to, I'll conclude with this, like Germany, right, where 10-year paper is hovering at negative 2% on again, inflation adjusted, an economy with no slack. Uh, it's the, the fiscal accounts are the strongest in years. The labor market is the strongest since 1991 or 1988. Uh, you have a very strong uh, balance of payment position. You have a very competitive exchange rate. And yet you have negative real uh, yields into the 10-year uh, sector. So I think that, um, again, of course, you might say, well, Carlos, this is because the, you know, Italy and the ECB has a mandate and under Merkel, et cetera, to keep the union together. But then it goes back to politics, right? We had elections in Germany the last couple of weeks. Mer Angie, Mer Angie is on her way out, Angela Merkel. And who knows what's going to happen uh, if that happens. So again, I don't know. I'm not claiming that I know. I'm just claiming that there, that is a risk premium that I am not going to ignore.
So I'll stop there and uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah. Okay, so Paolo is uh, going to lead the discussion, but also we have uh, two graduates. Uh, our first graduate of MBA graduate from the program Artists and Athletes is Doug Honegger. He represents six, or he's been representing 60 players, so he's very interested in, in investment, of course, so welcome here. And uh, Jose Licardo is just waiting here. Uh, he's interested in managing uh, family funds from Venezuela and Latin America. And of course, we have Paolo. Okay, but Carlos, before you relax, uh, Carlos, because I was organizing this conference, I think that I lost track of the markets and I saw my Amazon uh, okay. shares going from <laughs> right. 2000 to 1600. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> this goes with your theory that growth uh, is not going to do it or there is something else. You're saying value, no growth? Yes, I, I think so in, on a medium term basis, yes. On a medium term basis, I think today the market went up a lot. Again, my take could be wrong. It's because of uh, uh, risk premium came down on account of the tweet by Mr. Trump um, on China, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I'm going to follow up on uh, part of your presentation, uh, Carlos, actually excellent. Thank think, you. Really well done. Uh, I mean, I think the mix that I see, I mean, uh, when you have the risk-free rate going up in the U.S., volatility is up, and I, I, that's part, my first part of the question. Do you see a higher volatility regime, more peaks like at 25% as opposed to the 10%, combined also with uh, lower expected returns? You know, that's a toxic combination. Yeah, <laughs> it's it like is. you have a horrible sharp ratio. So I think uh, you gave already some hints in terms of your preferences uh, towards asset classes, but I think for a household or somebody, somebody really managing their own portfolio, what would you recommend? I mean, against the, the judgment that usually it's better, you know, to uh, navigate through the markets uh, without being too active, but you seem to suggest uh, a rebalancing, uh, certainly more towards cash. But the yes. question is, what would you sell uh, yes. to raise uh, the cash position? Yes. No, thanks for the question, Paolo. As George Soros you know, m says, and Stan Rockenmiller and others, I mean, volatility, especially the types of, uh, of spike that we've witnessed in October in terms of volatility, at times tend, tend to come at, at, at turning points in the cycle, right? Especially these huge spikes in volatility. In other words, there is some serial or auto correlation, if you will, on volatility when it reaches the type of thresholds, the type of levels that we saw in October. That's my view, and I think we're going through that. So what I would do if I were a retail investor, my advice, again, I could be wrong, don't follow it necessarily, it would be on any meaningful bounce, following the horrific month of October, any meaningful bounce, I would, I would take advantage of it and rebalance away from equities into cash or, 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 or sort of shorter duration, lower volatility kind of instruments, because I think we're in that sort of transition phase. Again, I could be wrong, but you know, when you combine that with another element that I forgot to mention, which is that the technical position in the market is, is one of vulnerability for risk assets, right? What do I mean by that? Cash levels at mutual funds are at, extreme, at a historical low level at the beginning of October. They may have gone up during the month of October. I don't think they did because the sell-off was too quick and too fast. So we haven't yet seen a lot of redemptions during the month of October. So my, my claim would be, but we have to wait for the end of the month, EPFR and other data, uh, 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 providers to, to tell us is that cash levels are low on a historical basis, uh, number one. Number two, the retail investors have not been buying equities. The real buyers of equities have been the corporations themselves, the share buybacks. This year, close to $1 trillion worth of stock is being bought by the, corp by the companies themselves. So the, the, um, the, um, because we just and we're just ending the earning, they were the earnings season in the United States. Uh, the now corporates will be free to will be will be free to buy back shares. During the earnings season, there there's a there's a blackout period for for cor for corporates to buy back their shares while they're still reporting and other other companies in their sectors being you know uh, uh, being in the process of reporting. So my sense is that we're get, we you know now of course today with the Trump tweet, so that clearly supported the market, Amazon and others. Um, my guess is that, again, we're going to see some share buybacks picking up, and we might retest, you know, not close to the high, but the recent high. What I would do if I were a return investor is I would take advantage of that and rebalance. That would be my sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a, a second a quick question so we then share the, the, the panel with our colleagues. 
uh, I think what it seems to suggest, I mean, when you have growing divergences uh, in terms of uh, business cycles across important regions, US, Europe, uh, emerging economies, uh, and you also have uh, increasing divergence uh, both in monetary and fiscal policies across uh, key regions. I mean, with the US, with uh, Italy on the other hand, uh, it seems like with this volatility regime, would this suggest uh, a diminishment of the role of uh, passive investment and really the hedge funds and active investors really getting, regaining control? So who's going to be leading the market next year? Thank you for that question. I have a very strong view. Not, of course, I'm somewhat biased, but if I'm just going to, because I'm biased, I'll just share with you, the, I'll provide you an answer that is based on, on numbers, on facts. When you look at history, and you look at the alpha generation on the part of active money managers and hedge fund managers in particular in the global macro arena, it's very much correlated to volatility. So, and, uh, and volatility, not just fin financial, but macro volatility. In other words, uh, whenever, uh, in periods in which uh, of, of low volatility, macro and financial, they go hand in hand, uh, macro uh, hedge fund managers tend to underperform. And that was the case in the last seven years. Conversely, whenever volatility picks up, macro managers tend to outperform. The same holds true for active money managers uh, because in periods of high volatility, the um, pairwise correlations tend to spike. When it, whenever, in other words, put differently, in environments where everything is going down, it's quite often because, uh, you know, especially when, whenever there are redemptions, investors are pulling the money out from mutual funds, et cetera. Managers, right, investment managers, have to sell everything, right? They sell across the board, so the good gets sold along with the bad, quote unquote. And so those are environments in which the more sort of focused long short equity hedge fund managers and active managers would take advantage of those sort of, uh, of that uh, um, uh, non-discriminating non -discriminating, uh, non -discriminating, uh, selling to essentially rebalance their portfolios by buying uh, attractive stocks and, uh, and, uh, and selling the, the more expensive. So the active should do better if we're right from a macro thesis perspective and the same holds true for, for my hedge fund managers. Time will tell. Yeah. Gentlemen. Carlos, yes. uh, you talked about the strength of the dollar. Do you think it's a smart move to acquire loans in the, in the Latin American currencies transform them into dollars and then invest them? Yes, well, that, that's essentially going short, right? Going long the dollar and going short emerging market currencies. That has worked brilliantly this year. Uh, I think the question is, do you do that uh, do, uh, do you do that going forward? There are two issues with that. If you do it, I mean, clearly only the very uh, professional investors should do it because volatility is high, number one. Unless you really do a small amount, you know, in other words, right size you're investing, in which case for someone who's not a dedicated professional investor, then you might as well not do it. Um, so if you do it, you should be do, do so through a professional investor. The second issue is that because of the spike in rates, um, the carry, in other words, the, the, the cost of holding that position has become more expensive. For some countries more than others, like Mexico and, and Brazil more than others, although the real has strengthened. Um, and then there are other countries where the, you know, it's just very liquid. So I think that uh, you have to be very tactical and very sort of uh, opportunistic is the word, I think, yeah. So do, you think, uh, yeah. do you think the inflation and the devaluation of those currencies will also help? The help? Um, help uh, if, if it happens. If it, if, even better? Yes, if, if it continues. The question is, what is the outlook on these currencies, right? I mean, I would defer to Paulo on the Real, right? Which is one of the biggest markets in Latin America and in emerging markets in terms of local debt instruments. Um, and, uh, so I think that uh, the, I would, on a medium term basis, I would look at, to put on the trades that you're mentioning, I would look at markets that offer value and that are strong from a balance sheet perspective. And so Mexico would be a lot closer for me to include in that, in that set of uh, investment uh, sort of opportunities. And Brazil might not be as close, but again, I would defer on, on Paulo. And countries like Turkey are just too volatile and and uh, too indebted. Argentina, again, to me was a, you know, for my, when I looked at the, um, and I was asking Federico uh, about the Argentine macro picture, which I have not been following, to me it really was a, a very episodic issue. I see a lot of value there. Um, it's very different from, let's say, Turkey, uh, where the uh, macro uh, picture has been very, mis very much mismanaged. Uh, 
Argentina has not, the fundamentals have been strengthening clearly, and you get paid, uh, although I'm not active in Argentina. So I would be very discriminating in terms of where you invest. I don't think I would just, you know, uh, just buy or, you know, go, sh go, sh go, um, go long the dollar against all currencies. There are certain countries where I would actually go the other way. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Just to, to follow up on, on, on me, uh, the issue that you raised with Donald Trump and his position with, with the Federal Reserve today, do you think that um, when you look at sort of many Donald Trumps in, in other countries, whether it's in Italy, in Austria, you know, they're, they're saying in Brazil today, do you think you're going to start to see more activist leaders trying to determine uh, their respective uh, fiduciary positions and, yes. and influence their central banks? Yes. No, thanks very much for the question. Um, I think that the, this is an issue that I feel very strongly about. I mean, if you look back, at the, um, at the last, um, I would say, starting probably in, uh, four years ago, it's, it is a global phenomenon, the ascendance of, these nat of nationalism around the world, right? You look around, you, you see Modi in India is a nationalistic leader. You see Duterte in Philippines. Uh, you see um, in China in some ways, even though it's a one party sort of ru uh, party rule system, there was essentially a coup d'etat you know, of sorts in August of 2012 where President Xi and his team took office, and now he's president for life, very much of a nationalistic uh, leader. Uh, Trump is very much of a nationalist. Uh, in Mexico, we have AMLO, which is who's a nationalist, of course. His credentials go back decades. In Latin America, we have a number of uh, you know, additional uh, exhibits of that. So I think that um, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that trend has various roots, which is not your question. Your question is, what does that signify for central bank policy, right? So that is, um, what it signifies is that it, it, it uh, contributes to raising the risk premium, right? Because if you're an investor, right? And one of the beauties of this central bank era that we've seen in the last 20 years or so, or 30 years, depending on whether you go back to Volcker or whether you go back to Greenspan, is that transparency in terms of the communication of central bank policy. And that communication, the sort of, the stuff that Mike Woodford, a co-author of Professor Santos and that Bernanke implemented at the Fed um, and others have done is through moral suasion and guidance to anchor long, you know, bring down term premium and long-term rates. A lot of that hinges at the end of the day on central bank autonomy and independence. And if you have a president of a country talking about, you know, the Fed is doing the wrong thing, I might fire Powell, which is pretty much what he said last week, that he's now considering it. I, as an investor, what do I, what do I, use, what do, I do with that information? I would essentially impute a higher risk premium on treasuries, right, as compared to paper from other countries. So at the margin, that's what it does. It reinforces that sort of, that, that claim that risk premium uh, might be going up across the board. It also emboldens other leaders as well to take the same position. There's no question about it. That, that uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question is really unrelated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Professor Santos knows We've been talking about on Canadian. You're Canadian. So Canada, we, yeah. Obviously, we're in primary resource country. Yeah. So when oil was at about 30, in, in the mid 30s, I went long on oil. Yeah, and, good. And Professor Santos and I had numerous discussions about oil and obviously, you know, that was a bad bet that worked out. Okay. Um, where do you see the resource industry going forward and specifically uh, the oil industry? Yes, I'm not an oil in, uh, a specialist. Uh, I think that the, um, well, the, the little that I know, right, we do have an energy analyst at my firm, is a she, she used to head the equity research team at JP Morgan in New York for the, all of the US, and she specializes in energy. Um, and I learned uh, some of this from her. Um, the, 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 well, the, the facts of the energy market seem to be, uh, there are a couple of drivers, right? Number one is that the incremental demand for energy comes from emerging market economies. India, the Middle East, right? A lot of the energy consumption, energy demand is coming from the Middle Eastern countries themselves, where the population growth remains strong, and uh, India, China, Latin America, whereas in the developed world, uh, the demand for energy is uh, contracting, right? Certainly on a per capita basis, very significantly. Again, multiple uh, speakers today spoke about some of the uh, uh, innovations that are taking place in the world, and some of them are tied to energy uh, consumption, right? And so uh, in terms of crude, which is what you're talking about, uh, our view is that is that uh, given our, our expectation that emerging market economies will continue to grow strongly over the coming years and decades, 
And given that most of the energy demand is coming from emerging market economies, the demand growth will be there. So what that means is that one can't embrace, one cannot embrace a bearish energy market outlook on account of demand. So the question is, what does that leave for sort of supply? You were talking about hydrocarbon particularly, right? Um, so th the, on that issue, the question is, how substitutable, what is the substitutability in terms of renewable energy and the hydrocarbons when it comes to what is happening in India and China and many other cases? That, uh, that's a micro and policy question. Again, I'm not an expert. So my opinion is very loosely held in, a, in response to your question. But I do feel compelled to give you a response is that what I've learned, what I've re read, and what I hear is that, that, that the, the, the substitutability factor is relatively low at the moment. Ask me five years from now, wh where is that? So I think that- um, Are that you including LNG in that as well? We're including LNG. So, so I think that there, of course, there's the US supply factor, and there are multiple schools of thought in terms of whether you know, the US is really gonna massively increase its production of, of, of net gas, and or not on fracking, and again, I'm not an expert, and we will not settle this. So I would say that to me, looking back at the last 12 months, given the strength of crude prices at a time when this dollar has been strong, that's a measure of underlying strength in that market. Now, if there is a recession, or if the momentum of the, in the global economy is, is, is to the downside, I would fade it. So we were very overweight energy up until about four weeks ago. And we've been fading it. We, we own a lot of Russia. And Russia also, we've been swelling it. Now we're underway in, like in some of our portfolios. So, but it's more tactical. It doesn't mean that I'm bearish long term. Because we, we, you know, as a macro manager, you, know, you generate alpha by being tactical. You know, sometimes you, you, you do it right. Sometimes you, do, you, you, know, you don't do it right. Up, I think on, on your question in terms of uh, emerging market currencies uh, on Brazil, on also, Brazil. or effects versus rates. Uh, on Brazil, I think it really depends on having implementation by the new government and the new economic team uh, on a significant fiscal adjustment, all the reforms that they need to do. Uh, my intuition is that they are going to build up a very strong economic team. Uh, they're all US trained PhDs, uh, orthodox. Uh, but the first phase is the easiest one, mm -hmm. which is uh, make the beautiful announcements of security reform, fiscal adjustment, big primary adjustments. Uh, the devil is in the details, uh, which is the implementation. And I think yeah, that's where I have more concerns is with the political uh, negotiating skills of the newly elected president and also of the economic team. So to me, if you're going to go Brazil, uh, to, it's a classic buy on the room or sell on the news. So it'd be very quick at selling. In terms of valuation, I don't think that the real is particularly cheap uh, at the current levels after it rallied after the elections. I think that the values are either in equities, which are, you know, despite the fact that they went up 30% in dollar terms, basically they're just rebounding from a huge collapse, right. and they're pretty much flat in the year. And on a PE basis, the Brazilian Bovespa, I think, uh, on the key shares, they are not, I, I wouldn't say cheap, but I would say there is good value for good, yeah. uh, good quality companies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, you either express uh, this Brazil trade through equities, uh, or the other interesting alternative that if it works is not just to receive rates outright, but it's really to play uh, a curve flattener, which means that you expect that the long uh, end of the, of the yield curve or 10 year rates, uh, because there's a lot of fiscal risk premium there, a lot of inflation risk premium, that that is going to collapse. Uh, so basically you play uh, a nice. yield curve as okay. opposed to being receiving outright. Uh, and I think that the question for you is, uh, he asked about uh, energy and oil, I mean, I think in this world that looks like uh, risk aversion is increasing, and central banks also have been pretty avid at buying gold, what do you think about gold? Yes, uh, thanks for the question and uh, for the insights on Brazil. Well, the latest data for the last month and a half show that uh, central banks have finally begun, begun to buy gold. So we, we like gold because of the option value. We view it more of a cash, in, you know, a cash substitute in a way, right? The option value of gold. Um, typically, um, so we, yeah, we do like gold, and we like gold miners. So that's the, the, you know, that's, that's the short answer. I think that uh, um, gold become, became very derated, uh, very, very derated uh, on multiple uh, uh, considerations. And, and so um, I think that, 
what makes gold, the gold price, we'll talk about gold miners separately, but gold, the gold price correlates particularly with equity volatility. So it's essentially a long volatility. Um, it will perform better than cash if they're under, in, doing, doing environments in which the equities and risk assets come down, sell off. And the question is whether, how much downside, how much more downside is there from here? I think the fact that uh, interest rates have moved up significantly in the US and we'll see what the Fed does, right, over the next year, year and a half. Um, our view, again, is that they might hike several times, maybe they probably will hike in December. And I would say for the moment, I would pencil in at least two hikes next year. Uh, but I wouldn't hold my breath on it. I wouldn't hold my breath on it. So in that environment, given what's priced in into the euro dollar curve, I think that gold price might have some downside, but don't own too much of it. But it is not, it is not early. Uh, to start owning some gold, to build a position. So yes, so I would say that I do like gold, maybe not at the full sort of exposure level that I may have six months from now, but I think it's, 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 uh, it's not uh, yeah, to build a position, yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, how do I see yeah, that? I, 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 what do you see yeah. the, the, the shape of the U.S.? Thank you. <laughs> Very good question. I hear what you're saying. Um, I think there are two offsets, right? Well, there are three. Number one, there are three elements in, in my response. Number one is yes, and I think you tend to agree, longer term inflation is not something to lose one's sleep over, right? Because of the micro and, and, and IT impact. Now, on a short term time frame, which is the context in which you're asking your question, um, I take some solace in two, uh, in two considerations. One is that CapEx has not been picking up. And CapEx moves along with employment dynamics, right? They're both substitute uh, factors in the production process. So I take solace in that, number one. And number two, unit labor cost growth on a year-in-year -year basis is pretty much flatlining. So I could be wrong again. <laughs> and then th the third element is that earlier in the, this year, a significant number of, U of states of the U.S. Union hiked uh, minimum wages for the first time in a number of years. So I would rather wait. Again, I'm not going long. You know, I'm not betting that uh, inflation is not going to pick up on the country. I mean, on the fixed income sleeve, I'm very cautious because I real well, number one, because I feel that the Fed is being compelled uh, by their sense of perhaps normalizing rates as a means to, you know, to buying a put, right, uh, if the cycle really turns lower, and also now, especially with the president exerting some moral suasion on it, they really have to assert their, their independence. So, uh, but I don't think, again, I could be wrong. I'm watching the data. I'm not too, uh, too worried about it. But I realize that it is a potential, a possibility, yeah. I didn't ask you a question. <laughs> I didn't ask you a question. Thank you. Yes, That's yield curve. Now, Just okay. a very quick uh, response on the yield curve. Uh, well, and your point on deficit. It is true. I mean, the the I mean the the, the Trump administration's um, decision to implement a a fiscal expansion so late in the cycle, right, via government expenditure increases and tax cuts, is rather extemporaneous, right? It's rarely occurred during the post-war period. And uh, it is so extemporaneous, in fact, that the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office and other agencies, are expecting, and Goldman and Merrill and other economists are expecting a bu budget deficit next year of close to 5.5% of GDP, even without a recession scenario. So if we admit the possibility of a recession in 2020, that budget deficit may end up being 9% or 8.5%. I think Larry Summers was on record saying that it could be 8%. So again, Going back to Paolo's question, I think that, yeah, that uh, flatteners, you know, that, um, I mean, that the long end, I don't think it's going to, is going to, I mean, given that inflation is not term, is going to, is going to issue longer term, but given that the Fed is, is hiking, I, I, I think that, I think that the, the, the curve might flatten, but not a lot more from here. 
But I think that right now, given the sell-off in, in October, that we saw in October in the, in the, in the equity markets, the Euro-dollar curve took out some of the hikes next year. So I don't think today is, uh, uh, if you were to, say, to tell me, put the trade on today, I think that the curve is likely to, to invert, to flatten from today's vantage point, uh, just purely on where we're at today. Longer term, you know, we'll see. Uh, the curve might end up steepening for two reasons. One, the deficit, and two, if term premium normalized, if something happens in Europe. No, and, then, and then Germany. And then Germany. Uh, raising bond G bond bond. If Germany, exactly, bond yields rise, it could, it could steepen. So I think it's, um, but we need to wait for the ECB. It's a political question. It's Italy. We don't know. I mean, again, I don't know what's going to happen. But. Sir, yes, at the back. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I lost, I missed what you just said last. Sorry, earlier on, you did see that the elephant in the room, are the institutions getting that? Yes, globally, yes. And one would start to get concerned if there was some irrationality to that. But when I look at some of the actions that are taking place in the market, for example, U.S. investment grade, based on going down 34% as per the Wall Street Journal article today, from last month to this month, high yield debt. Yes. So my question is, you concluded that you're not concerned about a recession taking many possibly not out until 2020. Yes. This is all normal, I would, I would concur, and think that let the market play its scenario out, and that there isn't really this irrationality unless they start to really pick up, as per what the media said, the Powell's going to go in and fight against Trump, which is not what I believe. Mm -hmm. but then You mean the rationale? By rational, you mean the, the decision on the part of corporates to yeah, not, not, not issue debt? I mean, rational in terms of the price action or rational in terms of the issuance that you mentioned? In terms of the issuance, Yes. Yes. Well, the, yeah, your point actually reminds me of uh, what Federico mentioned about the, that quarter that uh, he saw the downturn. And we saw that actually in the second quarter I turned to. I was seeing mentioned it that we, we saw in the Q2 of this year where you saw in, in the earlier time of, in the earlier quarter period of your tenure in Argentina. The, the drop in issuance that we saw in the last month or two, I think it's tactical. It's, it's, um, it's a, it's a uh, decision on the part of corporates to wait out, similar to what the IPOs were, were pulled in the last couple of weeks. So I wouldn't infer too much from that. Uh, we saw the same thing in China, right? The Chinese numbers in the second quarter were very were stronger than some expected. I think it was particularly on account of a lot of Hong Kong and mainland China names anticipating that tariffs would go up and so on. So they front loaded a lot of that. It was some sort of, it would be, it would be the equivalent of the inventory uh, um, buildup that you saw, which is a way of speculating uh, in, the, in the FX markets, it's typical. So uh, with durable goods uh, items particularly, yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't draw too much from the recent episode. Again, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, you know, when you invest in markets, it's all, about, it's all probabilistic, right? You know, you work with different scenarios and you place uh, probability uh, weights according, uh, to each scenario. So what I share with you was my baseline case. I could be wrong. And the weightings, the probability weightings that I would allocate to each of these scenarios will change over the course of time. Right now, that, that's my thinking. I think it, it pays to do the kind of rebalances that, uh, that I responded to Paolo's question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.